Thank you. Uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, it gives me great pleasure to open the session on entrepreneurship and innovation. I guess it must be the time for dinner. We've lost most of our friends and colleagues. Uh, so we'll make this session as exciting as we can. So let me put some context on the subject before we take a deep dive with our very distinguished guests. Entrepreneurship and innovation is in the DNA of Qatar. And you may, if you don't know why, you may ask how and why is that the case? You just need to reflect for a moment and ask yourself the question, how has this country so quickly created so much so soon? The first step in innovation uh, was taken by His Highness the Emir when he decided to put huge resources into the liquefaction of gas and then the conversion of gas to liquids today referred to as GTL, which tomorrow will be a major launch by a shell of this enterprise. In one stroke, using science and engineering, a fossil fuel in abundance and of least impact ecologically was available to the far corners of the world because it is now possible to transport this from Qatar. We are today amongst the top exporters of gas in the world with customers in Europe, Asia and the Americas. This was entrepreneurship and innovation at its best on a very large scale. The second step in innovation and entrepreneurship was the launching of Qatar Foundation, which led to the creation of QF Research, led universities, QNRF, and, and the Science Technology Park, and more recently by the formation of the institutes, which you heard a little bit about earlier. I've had the privilege of leading a small and dedicated team in the past five years at QSTP, which is our science park, in creating an engine for research-driven technology development in partnership with industry and our universities. We have today 46 companies, 800 scientists working on state-of-the-art projects, which are world-class because we have world-class partners. We have partners like ExxonMobil, Total, Shell, Microsoft, Cisco. These are big companies on the one hand. We have small companies as well and startups, and we have centers of applied research. Today we have a very distinguished uh, group of uh, uh, panel members from overseas and I'm happy to say excellent local talent as well. And unlike the last session, what I'd like to do is to set the scene by our local experts telling you what we have on the ground and what we are doing before we get into a debate about what we should do and could do. And I think this is very important because very few people realize the extent and depth of how much is going on today in this country. And I think it's very important to have that foundation before we move on. And finally, if we have time, uh, we will have uh, hopefully some questions and answers as well. So to begin with, uh, Ms. Haya El Ghanem, who is the Ent Entrepreneurship Manager and Acting Innovation Director in the Science Park, will give us a quick overview of what we are actually doing on the ground. Haya. Thank you, Dr. Tidu. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'll, uh, I'll speak today about a subject that's very close to my heart, that is uh, technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship in Qatar. And uh, I'll start by setting the scene uh, by talking about uh, where I'm working at Qatar Science and Technology Park. QSTP was inaugurated in March 2009 with the vision to become a recognized hub for uh, applied research, innovation, and entrepreneurship. And um, in, uh, in uh, Qatar Foundation and, and on a national level, QSTP spans uh, the, innovation, in the innovation entrepreneurship value chain uh, by interfacing between um, um, the outputs of research and uh, its application. And this is the point that I'd like to focus on today. Uh, QSTP also uh, supports corp corporate research in areas um, which are of national priority, um, energy, uh, healthcare, ICT, and environment. It also uh, engages in um, uh, active research uh, network partnerships. Uh, and this illustration shows some of the partnerships that QSTP started. Uh, an example would be the uh, Qatar University Wireless Innovation Center, uh, which was created in partnership with um, Qatar University, and also the, um, the uh, Qatar Robotic uh, Surgery Center in collaboration with Imperial College, Hamad Medical Corporation, 
uh, and other regional international actors. Uh, today, I'm going to focus on the challenges in taking research results um, and turning them into innovations and, and ventures in the knowledge economy. And uh, that, that would be the, the general, in, in a global sense, and also focusing on the local uh, challenges and how, how we started to uh, deal with those challenges um, in, in a bottom-up uh, process. The first global challenge is uh, that there is a difference between applied research and research, comma, applied. Coming from the industrial uh, paradigm, there is a growing division of lab labor that separates research from innovation. And uh, those activities um, uh, are handled by people with two, two types of people with, uh, with different roles. Uh, without focusing on the ultimate goal. So what is the ultimate goal of research? Are we interested in patents and papers? Or are we interested in, uh, in, in results and solutions? Uh, to me, the, the, uh, the ultimate goal of research would be solutions. We'd like to see less sickness, better health, drinkable water, clean energy, and, uh, and, and, and more, uh, more solutions. So globally, people struggle with the idea of uh, the, the interface between uh, research and innovation. And uh, while many consider this as an organizational challenge, I see it as an ethical challenge. I call it the, the ethics of utilization. People doing research and people doing innovation need to collaborate together to uh, focus on producing results that reach society. And this concept is not new, it's been studied um, for, for a long time uh, around the world. And uh, while research is very critical, it's not sufficient to reach utilization. Without innovation, research would fall into the, the valley of death. And, um, and uh, uh, we, we, need, we need to integrate both research and, and, uh, and innovation to, to reach to the utilization phase. And uh, it's said that um, for every dollar of research, it takes uh, nine to ten dollars of investment to, uh, to reach utilization. So there, there is a handoff um, of, of these activities from research to innovation in the traditional sense, uh, in, in a more linear model. Uh, but there, recently, there is a more integrated uh, uh, way, which is uh, the, the commonly known technology transfer uh, process. And if you go back in history, um, it, it took forever to, to, go, uh, to, to take research results into utilization, but with technology transfer, uh, there is a there is, uh, higher opportunity of uh, utilization. But I would argue that if we want to increase the um, utilization and, re and, and reaching uh, the solutions reaching to society, we need to have a fully integrated innovation system between research and innovation where neither is an end goal. They, they both are means to reach uh, the, um, the, the end goal. So obviously, if we want results, we need to, uh, to me, I think we need to integrate both processes to increase uh, the chance of utilization. And they're, they're done by different types of people. So it'll be fun to see both researchers and innovators working together. The second challenge is that in the uh, knowledge economy, the distinction between global and local tends to disappear. When, when we compete in a, in a local market, we, we tend to compete, with, uh, com compete against global uh, players. And in, in a knowledge-based business, um, the, the local market is not, usually not sufficient. It requ requires the global market to, um, to make the business viable. Uh, therefore, technology innovations and, and uh, knowledge-based businesses are global from day one. And the local focus uh, is, is no longer sufficient. So, uh, and that is in, uh, particularly um, uh, important for Qatar where the mor local market is very small. Um, so this leads us to the second challenge, which is uh, building the local capabilities to, um, 
to compete in a global market. Uh, so we, we, we have great, a great program, the Qatar Science Leadership Program, to create uh, the, uh, the um, local capabilities in uh, excelling in research. Uh, and the equivalent needs to be done for, for innovation. So in our uh, attempt to uh, come up with, with a local solution, uh, to overcome the first and second challenge, uh, we came up with a bottom-up uh, program, the Technology Innovation Entrepreneurship Program, uh, which is a QSTP initiative. Um, it's been running uh, for the past three years with continuous improvements um, to, to uh, solve uh, indigenous, to come up with an indig indigenous model to uh, overcome local solution, uh, local problems. Uh, so the Technology Innovation Entrepreneurship Program is a nine-month part-time uh, training program which is in, its, in itself is an entrepreneurial effort. The vision of the program is to accelerate the development of innovation entrepreneurship capacity, so that's the human, uh, human capability uh, uh, development in order to deliver technology-based uh, innovations and ventures uh, which is the uh, economic development element and uh, diversification of economy with uh, focusing on innovations with high social impact. So uh, TIAP is a development platform that uh, bridges, uh, brings together researchers, uh, inventors, business mentors, technical experts, ind industry experts, uh, customers, educators, um, and, and students to, uh, to, to bring up the, uh, to, to bring the solutions closer to implementation. We start the program by recruiting uh, students interested in technology startups in, in general from different uh, nationalities, ages, different uh, disciplines, and we match them with top level um, innovations uh, from inventors locally, from the, the education city universities, uh, or internationally, as long as the ideas have social and uh, economic impact, potential social and economic impact. And over the course of nine months, we provide the education um, in, um, it, that, that, it, that consists of practical, hands-on uh, skills and tools uh, to be applied on, uh, on each innovation project with the, with the goal of creating venture or packaging the innovation by the end of the program. Uh, and we realize that most of our students come from different, uh, different backgrounds, does not necessarily have to be from the same background as the assigned um, innovation project. So we provide them with all the needed support uh, from technical experts, business mentors, and, uh, uh, and each, each member of my, my team, uh, the innovation team at QSTP, we act as business developers and coordinators to, um, to support each team. So through the program, um, we were learning uh, about the local challenges to both creating local capabilities to compete on a, on a global level, as well as the challenges to take those projects forward and, and implement them beyond the program. And I'm going to go over some of those challenges. Uh, for the first set of challenges are in the startup level, where money is available, but we lack the, me the mechanism to, um, to take those ideas and invest in them. The, the high-risk capital is, is not available and it's not accessible. Uh, we identified, to, to, use a, to use an example, we, we identified a, a, a TB diagnostic tool that has, um, a, a, we, we made the business case, the social impact is obvious, uh, but when it comes to investing in, 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 this, in this idea, um, Perhaps maybe we need to educate both investors as well as entrepreneurs in what, what it takes to uh, take technology uh, businesses forward. There's also a challenge in uh, policies and regulations, and that is uh, in both um, IP policy of indigenous research uh, or this, the uh, business startup uh, regulations in Qatar in terms of minim minimum capital, 
uh, the 51% uh, uh, minimum Qatari ownership and the requirement of uh, office and so on. All these um, small details sometimes hinder the um, uh, starting up a company. There is also some market challenges uh, in, in the region, in the, in the MENA region in general. When, when, when a company is started in one state in the U.S., it benefits from a larger uh, market than just that state due to the um, uh, uh, uniform, almost uniform um, uh, laws and, uh, and regulations. Uh, in, in the MENA region, every country almost has its own uh, laws and regulations. So um, it, it, each, each, each startup company will have to get up that learning curve uh, in order to, to have access to the, to the MENA region market. Another uh, issue we faced is that we're not used to creating our local solutions. We, we got very comfortable in, uh, with buying solutions that are tested elsewhere. Um, I'll use the example of um, a, a, a solution that was created to improve the roads in Qatar, uh, but we were not able to test it because there is no mechanism to, ad to adopt um, local innovations in, in, the, in the current system, which puts us at a disadvantage. Uh, the third set of challenges is um, the human resources challenge. So it's, it's, it's good to get people excited about technology, innovation, entrepreneurship, but um, we were faced with um, the, the challenge that there is lower incentives to, uh, for locals and expats to uh, get into entrepreneurial ventures on a full-time basis. While the interest is there, the training and support uh, are, are there, but uh, taking up this, this kind of res risk nowadays is, um, is, is less favorable, possibly due to the higher rewards in, in other uh, sectors or less entrepreneurial roles, but it could also uh, be due to the um, low tolerance to failure. Which, which I think is, is common in other places, but um, I think people need to try, fail, and learn. Um, but uh, the thought of uh, failing stops many from trying. Uh, the last point is uh, solutions. We, we, uh, we, we realize that we have challenges, but uh, one of the prominent challenges that we face is that, and, and as a Qatari, I see that uh, when we seek advice uh, or solution, we tend to look for foreign models uh, disregarding the local context. And, and I cannot count the number of times I heard that Qatar should do the same as Silicon Valley, Singapore, Ireland, or I, 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 or I respect all these models in everywhere in the world, but the local context need to be taken into account as well. And uh, we need to take the relevant lessons. And. Um, uh, finally, the, uh, I feel like there is, there is uh, uh, a lot of uh, successful examples of bottom-up initiatives, but um, I, I get the sense that there is um, dominant preference among uh, organizations to come up with top-down solutions, um, which might be less entrepreneurial. I'll leave you with those two thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Haya. What you've heard now is an evolutionary process. It started with a formal program on entrepreneurship we had in the early days with the university that, that helped us to, to run the program. We then involved, and Bo Haydn, who's in the, in, in the audience somewhere here, came from Sweden to help us to initiate a different model, which would be on-the-job learning, if you like. You would learn as you worked along this, uh, this whole idea. And this is what Haya is now carrying through and, and putting uh, some flesh on, on the program. The program has been running for almost two years and we have had some 70 students go through it. So this is the formal structure, if you like, of what we do. There is an informal structure as well, which is much more focused on the needs of the country where we know there will be immediate traction. The valley of death you saw in, in the, the structure program is one thing, but if you choose your projects carefully, you can choose projects which have a, a huge national impact. And I'll give you an example in the energy sector. 
one of the early projects we in, got ourselves involved in, and, and which didn't exist in this country, was the research and development in the geosciences area for oil and gas. This is a country that has its lifeblood from oil and gas, and yet there was no national research program on oil and gas. And that was a program initiated with Shell, Qatar Petroleum, and Imperial College, and QSTP. And this was, the thought behind that was to bring state-of-the-art knowledge in this field to Qatar and build a national capability which would be on the ground. So this project is initially being incubated in London. It's moving here in stages. The data is in this country. Uh, Shell and QP are obviously the big players in this country. And that's the model we use. If there is traction, we, we launch into major programs on a big scale. The, and the other project which I'd like to mention briefly, and you'll hear a little bit more about now, uh, is, is uh, the renewable energy space. We felt we had to, to attack the area of renewable energy, and the most obvious area was solar power. And, and solar energy is obviously the, the thing to go for. There's plenty of sunshine in this country. And it, the question then remains, what part of that program are you going to enter? And you'll get a glimpse of that in a moment from Omran. But the part we, we won't have time to talk about is the front end where you produce the raw material that goes into creating solar cells. This is a very high investment uh, area which needs huge investments, big engineering capability. We carried out design studies and feasibility studies and the, the outcome of all that was that there is a need and there is competitive advantage in us getting into this area and it's the area is called the generation of polys polysilicon material. And today we have an investment of some $800 million which is going into creating a factory which will produce 8,000 tons of polysilicon. This is how you translate research ideas very quickly in, into feasibility studies that would go into design phase and you then go and build the facility. And, and you only commit such large amounts of money if you have offtake agreements and we have those. The other end of the spectrum is what you'll hear about now and that is what do you do with solar energy as such and how do you go about addressing it. And I'll get uh, Omran Kawari to, to speak about it. Omran is one of our young Qatari talents. He was the youngest managing director at the age of 25 of Qatar Gas in London. He's, he oversaw the South Hook project. And the first challenge I had was to try and persuade him to, live, to give up his big comfortable job and come and have a, a startup uh, company. So Omran, over to you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Your Excellencies, Dr. Saroud, Dr. Maini, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for allowing me the chance to speak to you today. Um, first of all, Dr. Maini, it wasn't such an easy job, <laughs> but uh, I appreciate your words. I was asked to come today and um, really give you a story, give you a bit of uh, history of my uh, story and how we got from an idea to a uh, business which is now called Green Gulf. So I'll try to keep it brief so that we have time to talk to our uh, honorable uh, panelists. So first of all, I, as Dr. Tidumani mentioned, I joined Qatar Gas in 1999 uh, after graduating from university. I spent 10 years in various jobs basically in the oil and gas sector in government. Uh, towards 2009, I approached QSTP and QF with an idea that uh, came through my research in my MBA, which is develop a new company called Green Gulf, which will basically focus on the renewable energy from the downstream side uh, and, and uh, look at it from a practical applications perspective and become a, a clean tech company. And the reason why I thought it was the right idea, why solar and why Qatar? Well, there's several, uh, several reasons for that. First of all, uh, the climate and sustainability. The climate uh, from two perspectives. First of all, <laughs> the leadership we have in this country. It was very clear that even though we're an oil and gas economy, there was a lot of focus on knowledge, uh, knowledge related sectors. And, uh, and this was identified as one of them. In addition to that, in the region, there's a lot of uh, concern now about uh, DC, DCT grid and power issues, and at the same time, more awareness on CO2 and pollution reduction. So the climate in, in both senses was the right time uh, to start this kind of venture. In addition, there was a lot of other um, assets, more macro level. Um, at that time, 2009, it was still during the feasibility stage for the polysilicon plant. And thinking from a macro perspective, it would make sense to, for a fossil economy to think of other ways to diversify. 
and also to enter markets which other people are entering into anyway and to think of international deployment. So we, I really felt that clean technology, solar energy specifically, was a good complementary asset. Author your flagship and knowledge. Also, being a uh, energy capital in many ways, where LNG is the largest, largest producer of LNG in the world, largest producer of GTL in the world, uh, a huge producer of oil, uh, Qatar is already has a huge expertise in energy. In addition to that, we have a lot of universities, uh, Qatar University, Texas A&M University, that focus on the engineering side. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, universities that focus on the policy side, such as Georgetown and uh, Carnegie Mellon and so on and so on. It really complemented uh, the infrastructure that was already there. So being able to create a Qatari-based company in this sector will really play on those synergies. And on top of that also, there is definitely a national agenda uh, that, that was directly uh, mentioned in the national development strategy and also the Qatar national vision before that. One of the four pillars, uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, is environmental, um, environmental protection. And it was very important, uh, the leadership identified that the way to do that is to focus on technology. So we felt that these are all, the, from the macro perspective, the right place to be based. So that these are mainly the reasons why solar and Qatar. And finally, the, probably the, the most important one for me personally was the synergies that we had in terms of companies. Uh, it's great to have universities, uh, all due respect to academics. We also need uh, the private sector and business because that's the way we will, as a businessman, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an academic, but uh, the only way to really take academics forward in terms of business, you need to have companies involved. We were lucky to have QSTP, of course. QS Tech was established recently after, which is the polysilicon plant. But also on top of that, it was uh, investors looking to invest in the sector. In addition to all those, we had also many companies such as GE, uh, Siemens, and so on, which are being or based in Qatar, which can add value in many ways. And of course, Chevron, which is our partner, I'll talk about now. So we, we came up with, a, with several plans. I will talk about the timeline later. But basically what we came up with was a way to enter the, the sector, uh, or the, or hit the ground running, basically. Uh, ideally, we'd like to have our own laboratories and work from the material side and, all the way, and work our way all the way down the chain. But as a businessman, I thought the best way to do this was to basically focus, allow, create a platform that will encourage companies from around the world to come, uh, provide their equipment, whether it's designed in Japan, U.S., and in, in Europe, test it, and then work with those companies to utilize their R&D labs to create second-generation uh, technologies that are... Um, basically uh, adept for this climate, which is high heat, high humidity, and high dust. Later on, we would then take those, those knowledge and transfer them into a research lab and so on, and long term, which is no doubt Qatar will, will be a leader in that. But for me, thinking of from two or three time horizon, this was the best way to do it. And, and by doing that also allowed us to create a knowledge bank right away of getting uh, data and getting know-how, uh, and from a business perspective, allowing us to, to use that from an advisory perspective. So we were uh, allocated, we were uh, very lucky to have the support from our foundation and from Her Highness uh, Sheikha Moza Mid Nasser. She sponsored the project early on and we were able to get the land that we needed. And late in the process, we also brought in an international company, Chevron, that can, became 50% partner with us, which added a lot to the whole process. And now we're in the final stages of, of uh, concluding this project, the first phase of this project. So just to give you an idea, I won't bore you, but to show you that there's a lot that needs to get done in those two years. Uh, but what happened in those two years is that we were benefited from infrastructure and from what's available in Qatar to basically help us hold our hands throughout this process. We met with over 180 companies. We signed a partnership with an international company. We dealt with several government uh, entities. And we moved from a company of one person, myself, to a company now which is basically the leading uh, clean tech company in, in the Gulf. And within those two years, we also were able to acquire a lot of knowledge. In fact, with... Um, in 2011, we installed uh, the panels uh, of this building. So 15% of the power of this building is solar powered. This is a project that we, we worked on. So this is the timeline to show you that we, uh, with the right support, like QSTP, we're able to meet these milestones. And then just to leave you with this final slide, this is how the test facility would look like. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but basically it shows you there's a 25 different companies, uh, 18, uh, 16 different technologies that we're testing. And we'll be looking to practical applications, not just power generation, but also solar cooling. And we're working directly with people, uh, customers of this technology, such as the World Cup uh, 2022, uh, the different real estate projects, such as Musharib, and so on, to actually provide them solutions and technology that they need. 
and, to, and by working with those companies, we're slowly taking knowledge from them to us, and then hopefully in the next few years create their own products. So thank you very much. Thank you, Imran. I guess you can now begin to see the formal process we talked about and the informal process and how the informal process can lead to all sorts of in interesting possibilities. If you operate in the right area where there's right, there is traction, for example, the traction for us was uh, the polysilicon project and also, of course, the 2022 World Cup is going to need a lot of power and a lot of solar cooling. So these were major drivers in accelerating our commitment to this program. And I think you can see that with 25 companies coming here, we're going to pick up an awful lot of knowledge at, at a very good pace and, and, and a good price too. Because all these companies who are coming here are coming with their own funding. They're going to spend their own money to bring their equipment here. And we'll be doing the testing and, and the analysis. Now what that does, it, it gives you a large platform to do R&D. So the next stage will be what sort of surfaces do you work on? What nanomaterials do you use? What paints do you work with? What, uh, what do you put at the back end of the, the solar power demonstrator? These are smart grids, and already smart grids are becoming a very, very important issue in, in, in renewable energy. So what this particular project has done, uh, when it's been well thought out, it, it allows you to get traction very quickly, and it spawns a whole lot of new areas of energy research. And this is the philosophy we have in other sectors, in environment, in ICT, and in healthcare. And what we hope to do is to create the platforms for our universities and research institutes to have some really serious meat to get, in, in, uh, get hold of to do research. And that's the whole plan. So now, having heard the baseline, we'll get our distinguished experts from our side to give us their reactions, their, their experience. And we'll begin with Stephen Kultai, who until recently was the senior advisor on ent entrepreneurship to the United States Department of State. Thank you. Is the mic, mic on? Hello? Yes. yes. Uh, thank you for, for having me. Fascinating presentation. This is my first time in, uh, in Qatar and in Doha. Uh, so I, I uh, am learning uh, at every turn. Um, the work that, uh, that I have been doing is, um, has been in, in about uh, eight countries. Um, and uh, mostly uh, Muslim countries, uh, Egypt, Indonesia, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, Tunisia, and Morocco is where I've spent most of the last two years. And it focuses on uh, the creation of w w what, what we call uh, entrepreneurship ecosystems. And the idea is that um, an ecosystem uh, requires uh, several parts, several pillars. And uh, we've identified six aspects of that ecosystem, um, which, are, which is true whether you're in the United States or anywhere around the world, and I would imagine is true here too. In fact, um, the, the, the program uh, has a, a US version, which is called Startup America, which is about uh, bolstering the entrepreneurial ecosystem in the 90% of America that isn't Silicon Valley or Route 128, or the Research Triangle. So the majority of America is, 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 is also uh, in need of, of the same sort of effort. And what we found is that there are six main elements to creating an ecosystem. And it's true, uh, in our experience, whether you are in um, you know, uh, Maine, or in uh, Egypt, or in Indonesia, or in Mississippi. And those are... Um, the need to identify, train, connect and sustain, which is really about mentoring, fund, enable the public policy environment, the regulatory environment, and lastly, but very importantly, celebrate entrepreneurs. Um, in every situation um, that we uh, find ourselves in, whether, again, whether it's in the US or abroad, um, there is uh, a lot of evidence to show that unless you are firing on all pistons, unless you are moving in each of these six areas together, you don't really move the needle. And therefore, no one thing is usually sufficient. Starting a training program without having a mentoring program, starting a mentoring program without having access to early stage capital, 
having successful young companies but keeping it a secret by not celebrating them, and particularly successful entrepreneurs that are local. Uh, you know, it's, I, I never, when I'm traveling, I never talk about successful American entrepreneurs when you're in in, in Egypt or when you're in, in Indonesia because that's a totally different environment. So it's terribly important, and I agree with you, Haya, that it's very important to, to have a local sensibility. By the same token, it is true that these elements of the ecosystem are true everywhere. And I think one thing that, that I find particularly interesting in the, in the presentations that, that you made is, um, you know, clearly this is a, 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 an enormously dynamic country. Clearly there's a lot going on. Uh, but what we've learned, at least in, in the other places I've worked, is that um, just as no man is an island, no country is an island. And that's particularly true um, these days. So one, in, one, one immediate reaction I have is that um, I, I think that, uh, A, what's going on here needs to be celebrated a lot more. So I think that there is a marketing effort that needs to happen. Um, but B is, um, I also think that there is, there's probably a huge opportunity to um, start to work in all of the areas of the ecosystem and, and to knit it together probably first on a regional basis um, with, with some of the other countries. You know, I, I, I have to say um, in, in Jordan, for example, uh, which is not a huge country, it's bigger than Qatar, but it's not uh, Egypt. Um, you know, there, there, in the last uh, two or three years, um, there have been extraordinary uh, strides. Uh, in fact, uh, the first uh, acquisition of a startup uh, by a major American firm, in this case, uh, the acquisition of Maktoub by Yahoo about 18 months ago or 12 months ago, um, was a sign that that uh, startup community was coming of age. The same is true in Turkey, um, where you have the first major investment by a USBC. Kleiner Perkins made a substantial investment in TrendyDoll, which is an online e-commerce uh, business. So, so the region absolutely in different places is moving uh, forward, and there is starting to be more international interest. And I think the time is now for Qatar to be connected uh, in, in, in that region and to be part of that region. So that's one of the initial um, uh, observations I have. Thank you, uh, Stephen. I think it's a, a point very well taken uh, in, in that uh, we need to do more in terms of marketing ourselves and forming regional clusters of activity. The reason we have not done it so far is because we wanted to really establish ourselves as a serious player before we moved on and made noise about going into other areas. There, there is always a tendency for people to think, ah, here come the Qataris because they have lots of money. And what we wanted to, to, to really uh, express and get the message across was, here come the Qataris because they have something really substantial to offer in terms of technology and management. And I think you'll see uh, in the case of uh, some of the projects that uh, Umran was talking of in terms of green gulf, in the region, there will be uptake in partnerships. Uh, we are talking very closely with the Saudi Arabians about working with them. And, and I think this will come uh, with time. And, and the issue is, how quickly do you go? And I think we've been rather cautious in, in rushing in, in into these areas. And, and perhaps the time is in, in the new year for us to open the taps a little bit and accelerate our efforts. The point is well taken. And I think if you, if you, there is one of our spin-out companies we have called Wimatech, which is developing LTE, which is the next generation of uh, mobile telecommunications after 3G. And that has a, a cell in Jordan. Some six uh, or eight developers are currently being funded in Jordan as subcontractors to accelerate the, this, the, the project. And I think one could make it more formal rather than ad hoc. And the point is extremely well taken, and we'll work on it and, and hope to follow up with you. And now there's going to be a slight change of pace in that we have two very distinguished uh, health sciences ph stroke pharmaceutical experts with us. Uh, we haven't talked about that area. So we'll begin with Paul Stoffels, who's the worldwide chairman of Janssen, Johnson & Johnson Pharmaceuticals. And they're well known for working in a collaborative manner with universities. So really, uh, Paul, we'd like to hear your initial reaction and, and your, your ideas on how we should go forward. Um, first, let me say that I was 
I'm very impressed with what I just heard from our two, two Qatari colleagues. I think, but you see that there is gravity in the world. In the end, the thinking and the focus leads to a very similar type of, of, of process. What is needed to get the good science and needed to get the good results. Um, I was, uh, um, I'm a physician scientist um, and I was driven in my early life of making a difference for, uh, I'm still, but uh, making a difference in the world by uh, changing, um, changing medicine and driving medical need, uh, solu driving solutions for medical need. And I started my life working in Africa, uh, in Congo and Rwanda in HIV space, where the medical need was like exceptional. And I never left that space, um, but then was attracted to the pharmaceutical industry because there, by doing the science, applied science, you can go from taking care for a patient to taking care for the world. You know? And I had all parts of my life, first as a young scientist in a pharmaceutical company working with Paul Janssen, then with my partner Rudy Powers, who is here in the, in the room also, starting up a biotech business and, uh, and creating new companies, but also, more important, creating a drug. Then being acquired by J&J &J, um, because uh, the capital markets were not accessible, so we needed some more capital to get our drugs developed. Uh, now leading the group, for the, leading the pharmaceutical group, having gone through all of the different uh, stages in life and stages in entrepreneurship. One thing which is the most critical one is medical, dedicated to medical need. If you are not uh, committed to the health uh, and making a difference in health, over the short, medium, and long term, you cannot survive here. It is such a long-term business where getting the basic science into a medical innovation, most of the time, when it gets from, when there's a space of drugs, it takes you 20 years. Yeah? I was working in HIV in 89 on science, which led this year to a new drug. I le I, and it followed me through all of the different ventures I was, but we were able to do it after 20 years. Um, so medical need is the driver in, I think, most of the large pharmaceutical companies. Solving medical need is what we do and where we stand for. If you look at what is needed to get that done, is that we need to find ways on converting science into solutions for medical need. Two ways, um, or a few principles. Um, you need a lot of science going on. I call it the Darwin principle. A lot of science needs to go on. A lot of opportunities need to happen in order to end up with a few good ones. You need diversity in thought, diversity of people, then diversity of initiatives. And that's where I think all this type of initiative where you, where you create that opportunity for scientists, where you provide them funds, where they can start thinking and use their bright, new, their bright young minds is very, very critical. Um, the second thing I think which is important is if you, if you want to make a difference in the healthcare, you can't just look at today. You have to predict where healthcare is going to be 10, 15 years from now, and you have to think on what am I doing today which can compete 15 years from now. Because if you, com if you think about today, your competitive generic drugs, you name it, everything will take that market away before you know it. Yeah? So it's, uh, you need to be grounded first in science today, but in a vision of the future, which is very, very significant. Can we cure cancer? Can we prevent cancer? Can we cure Alzheimer? Can we prevent Alzheimer? Can we cure HIV instead of treat lifelong now? But all these things need to be grounded on the basis of a long-term vision on where to go. And then I think the world has evolved from pharmaceutical companies doing innovation inside their own house in, uh, towards a very um, collaborative space where you have academic science going into biotech, biotech science going into industry, industry bringing, bringing solutions worldwide to the market. That cascade is needed in order to pay for all of it. In the end, the payers in the market, those who pay for our drugs, fuel the whole engine of the science throughout. Um, so that is uh, most important is the people. Yeah? And what I heard a colleague describe on the environment you need, to, you need to create. First, I said diversity is important. Environment to fail is probably one of the most important fields in medical and, and basic science. Science is not engineering. Yeah? 
if you, well, engineering is a kind of science, but medical science, where you go from basic science to a drug, most of us, we invest in drugs. If you invest in an Airbus A380, and at the end of the road, at the end of that investment, the wheels don't function, you replace the wheels. Yeah? If you invest in a pharmaceutical drug, with in the late stage still 50% chance of failure, if you, if you do that experiment in phase three, you still can fail and use your entire investment. And say, Monsev and I, we are, and our groups, we are investing in drugs, which typically take us $2 billion to invest and fail. And still we have to go on. You, and that cascade of, of failing has to grow trust and failing has to grow to the organization in order to make your organization work. It's a very simple principle. You take the risk, me the boss, I take the blame. And that cascade has to go to the organization in order to create an entrepreneurial uh, group of people. And that is the, that is the, um, that are the few principles. In the end, there is something which in the today's world is very important for people. On the one hand, with all we do, we make a difference. We, we try to bring the most innovative and best drugs. And, uh, and those are typically applicable in the Western world because they can pay for it. What's important today is that we also bring science which is applicable and useful worldwide for the rich countries, but also for the poor countries. And therefore, in your organization, as a global organization, have a balance between what you do for making the big bucks in the West com combined with making a difference for your, um, for your com for, with your science in the world and therefore being dedicated to, uh, to HIV, to TB, to diseases of developing world, but also deploying the, the science on metabolic today on obesity, on, on diabetes type 2, what we learn in the West, how can we deploy that in the rest of the world is going to be critical. And hold that thinking, the most important factor is engagement of your people. If you, have one, if you have 100 people and they are with you on driving the difference in medical need, you have 150 people. If you're the, in just for the business, you have 50 people who come and work for 9, nine to 5. And it's a whole concept of how you drive, um, how you build your organization with people, how you drive your portfolio in the world, how you manage the trust and the risk and the failure in order to build an organization which in the end can deliver new products which are making a difference in the world. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. You can now see, ladies and gentlemen, why we left the medical world out of our example. It is a very difficult area to be in. And we made a very early decision in, in our life at QSTP to, to be very careful about the, the medical sciences. We wanted to give our university system and our research institutes time to build up a capacity. In the meantime, we are focused on platform technologies. We feel that what we can address today is to somehow get our hands on the data that's valuable in this country. What's valuable in this country, uh, in, in, a, in a bizarre sense, is the fact that there are a lot of people who have diabetes, a lot of people who have coronary disease and hypertension. And, and if we can somehow find ways of measuring things, we, we would actually attract good scientists. It's, it's like good scientists go to countries in West Africa because the data is there in AIDS and malaria. And so what we have concentrated on in, in the last three or four years is to work on platforms that collect data. And we've been very successful and we, we don't have time today, but we've developed a communications technique for, and a platform for, which is unique for picking up different sensors that give you all sorts of uh, personalized body uh, input, whether it's heart rate, ECG, blood count, and we can take literally any sensor from anywhere in the world and communicate with it through our platform. And this is a very powerful technique. It's been trialed and we've done proof of concept in four or five different environments. And it's now being formally tried out in Italy by the, the, the medical world. And so it's let, a tough area. Let me answer on that one. It's very critical today. Most of the answers for the next generation drugs come out of the clinic. It's on what is the how current drugs behave in the clinic helps us a lot to, to go uh, after the next drug, personalized medicine, the genetics, everything today. Learning from the clinic is probably the most powerful yep. future uh, tool for pharmaceutical. Thank you. So we're hopefully on the right track. So mm -hmm. I think to, to wind up now, I have great pleasure in asking Dr. Monsef, who is the chairman of GSK, which is the largest pharmaceutical company in the world. 
and one with which I had a very, very happy relationship before I came to Qatar five years ago at Imperial College. They, they were the leaders in university industry collaboration and, and so Mark Walpole will remember he was instrumental in, in drawing up the program with GSK and, and I would love to hear from you what your feedback is and what you think we should be doing. Okay, well, thanks very much. Very happy to be here. And just a slight correction, I'm not the chairman of GSK, but for R&D no, and R &D. GSK. Uh, maybe just a few words to congratulate Hayat and Umran. I thought it was really refreshing to see. I'll tell you what, it's the passion and that kind of personal energy and commitment that uh, one could feel in your presentation, which I think is one of the number one ingredient for entrepreneurship and innovation to happen because by definition you start to try and achieve something that has not been achieved before. And you need to believe in it, you need to have a vision, and you need to be able to engage others and convince them to come with you. When, what I thought I'll do is kind of sum up what, hap what I heard here and at the same time do it through maybe a description of what went on in, in my company over the past six years and the learning we had from it. Uh, it's very pertinent to many of the points that, that my colleagues and Hayat and Imran pointed at. When I, when I became head of R&D for GSK about six years ago, the R&D machine was kind of tired and not very productive and we worked very hard to try and find ways to rejuvenate it and we instill energy and drive and passion and entrepreneurialism uh, in order to drive productivity forward. And in the process of doing that, we also opened up this organization to, to the world of, of innovation that exists outside of us. And through that process, I became very, very much attuned to how critically important what I call the biotech ecosystem in, in the case of the pharmaceutical industry was to our survival and therefore I started to work very hard to make sure it continues and I'm sure you've seen lately that we've been investing substantial amount of money to help entrepreneurs, uh, startup companies, you know, pursue their ideas and translate them into medicines potentially or in this one of the steps towards becoming a medicine which does take a long time and a lot of money. So try to learn, you know, what is it? What is it that make a difference between success and failure? And what are the important ingredients? And it's interesting you cited six, I have five, but I think they, they combine. Of course, the first one is to have ideas. And I thought I had the description that you have made on how you put ideas in connection with what you called innovators was very interesting. Although I believe people need to own the idea and have that passion, passion and, and belief behind it. The second key point, which I'll come back to later, is talent and leadership. Absolutely vital. If I had to select one point that really for me is the biggest predictor of success or failure is talent and leadership. And Next to it is the culture in the milieu in which you are, which I'll come back to. The third ingredient is, is of course, money uh, that you need to access. And I think it's really a pity that your TB diagnostic test couldn't be funded. I'll be happy to hear about it. Maybe it is very interesting. Uh, but that one should reflect, indeed, that to me, is part of the culture of uh, of a society, uh, of a country or a region, of investing at risk or not. But also, I think Steve, you spoke about the um, regulations, and in particular instance, you know, how tax regulations and incentives are put there for capital to take the risk and invest in new ideas. The fourth key ingredient are facilities and infrastructure in which you can test your, your ideas and, and develop them. Uh, and <clears throat> the fifth one, which with talent and leadership, as I said, is the most important, is culture. And I'm, I'm going to challenge my UK colleagues a little bit here and just say, 
you know, the perspective in, in GlaxoSmithKline that we have of, of the UK in terms of biomedicine is probably the best place in the world for innovation in medical sciences, but it's probably not by far the best place for entrepreneurial uh, translation of that science into medicine. And there is a lot of capital in the UK. There's a lot of academic talent in the UK. There's a lot of facilities in the UK. I think one of the issues that existed and that's being changed, and, and GSK is participating in that process, is there was a society was not rewarding, acknowledging successful entrepreneurialism as societal success. And therefore, people with great ideas were not driven to actually take the risk and try to translate their, their ideas into, into a product. And I think this is something here in Qatar that you really need to do. And, and Umran, as you were describing your example, I, I thought I felt a lot of pride in what you were saying in the fact of being an entrepreneur and being successful. I think it's very important. There isn't only one way to be successful. And ideas usually come out in academia, but they need to be translated to the rest of the uh, value creation chain. And, and all of those dimensions need to be uh, incentivized and recognized. Another dimension, I think, in there that defines the culture, which I also heard in the two presentations, is you know, sometimes success is money. Sometimes success is societal impact. I mean, or Paul, you were talking about, you know, uh, addressing public health or a medical need. And uh, again, it's, I think, very, very important as you, as you define your models to, to incentivize entrepreneurialism, that, that the definitions of success or the criteria of success are, are palatable and are actually in sync with the society and the culture in which you live, right? You feel very comfortable in the US to say how much money you make. Uh, I think there are other cultures where you would never hear that, but you would say, you know, I don't know how much many patents or what product you were involved with or what company you've, you've uh, participated to. So I thought those were some points that, that are very important. I want to finish on the talent and leadership. One of my learnings is the difference between most people I see that actually achieve and those that don't is the fact that those who achieve have this internal belief that they can do it, even if it doesn't exist yet. And what I notice is this is something that comes from, that can, that can be actually given to people or, or it can help people get there if you coach them, if you mentor them, if you spend time with people. If you take people who have achieved things that were very difficult to see being achieved and they spend time with young entrepreneurs or academics and they just interact normally. And finally, people realize that achieving something grand is actually quite simple. And when you're actually doing it, you have no idea you're achieving something grand. That lowers the bar of believing what you can do. You know, so, so low that you actually believe in your ideas and you actually do them. I hope I translated what I'm trying to say here, but it's so important to uh, to not only train people in, in courses and curses, but, but also to have them spend time with people who achieve big things and realize, you know what, it's quite plain. You know, it's just a matter of doing it and it's quite normal. And therefore, try it yourself and, uh, and go for it. So if I had, I had a final recommendation to make is there are lots of leaders and entrepreneurs and industrialists in the Arab and the Muslim world that have achieved a lot of things. And I think for Qatar, for 
the Arab world, for the Muslim world, for the vision that the foundation has to really connect. I think creating a network of those, you know, academics, industrialists, entrepreneurs, achievers, to, to spend time with, you know, a real network that can invest some time, spend time with, with talent, uh, would make a huge difference. Thank you. That was very thoughtful. And um, I think in the cultural context, it's clear that in living in Qatar, it's the recognition of success is not financial. It, it, it cannot be financial, as long as you don't lose money. Um, success is judged by the peer group who recognizes your contribution and its, and its success and its importance and its impact. Because you know, really, given the price of oil and gas, there's no way you can compete to to make more money, to justify money as the criteria for success. So I think we are very lucky in that we have a country and, and, a, and a leadership which recognizes success more in terms of contribution and impact. And the impact is very easily judged. You know, we have projects which are world class and they're recognized as such. Uh, and the easiest test for me is when co-funding comes on the table. We have an idea, you know, we have a very talented young lady who is a professor at Texas A&M in Qatar. She had a, a, a proposition in terms of uh, breaking methane gas into carbon and, and hydrogen in a, in a very unique way. And we backed her in her theoretical work. And what was interesting was that the German government felt this was such an interesting project that they would co-fund the program. And this was extraordinary for us to, to find that somebody here had done some work which we had nurtured for a while and that a major German lab and the government would back it as well. And, and that's been, if you like, the litmus test for us in many, many of our projects. And the same goes with our solar demonstrator. We have 25 companies who are going to spend their own money to come here. And there must be some reason they want to come. And, 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 and so that's in, in terms of success. It's, it's an important area. I think you've highlighted something very useful for us. Now, I think we have a few minutes. I'm not sure if there's a microphone. If the, any questions from the audience, we'd be happy to, to, I'm sure the panel will be able to take them. Do we have a microphone in, in the audience? If there are questions, please. There's one near the front. Uh, yes. Oh, uh, so, my name is Dr. Mustafa Abdelwaide from Morocco, and I spent a few years at Harvard University. I am an inventor of few biotechnologies. And uh, what I am hearing from Dr. Mosef is really inspiring. I have a, a quick comment because we have here maybe more than 100 talented Arab scientists coming from abroad. And I was talking to a few of them yesterday, asking them, is it enough for us to talk about what we can bring here in terms of uh, know-how technology? Can we do that with the Qatar Foundation in a few days? So I was suggesting to them maybe to gather our voice and suggest what Dr. Mosif was saying. There are talented people here, they need time, and I don't think that two or three days is enough uh, and to maybe miss some of the great opportunities that we can see from what we heard yesterday. The mission is innovation to think. We have great thinkers here, and I am suggesting to allow some of them to gather their voice, and to do real brainstorming. I would love to hear from Dr. Monsef some of the perspective that he can suggest to Arabic countries like Qatar. Uh, we, we heard about many successful stories. Morocco is trying to do the same thing as Qatar, but the funding is not there. There's a lot of bright people. The political will is there, but it's not enough as here. So I hope that some talented Arabs Scientists coming from abroad could gather their voice and just to take time and to see if there is some great things that could happen with what is available here, the funding, the political ways, with people who want to give an input. Thank you. Monsef, any comments? I uh, commend your uh, passion. And I think you're right. Do something. You know, I always say the difference between success and failure is execution. 
Everybody can have a good strategy. In fact, there's a little secret. You can copy somebody else's strategy if it's smart. <laughs> the difference is execution. Most, most people and most enterprise start something and then change for no reason. So, and, and execution takes a lot of leadership. And I could hear some of that in, I don't know what's your name. I, sorry, I didn't remember your name, but. I have uh, do it. Maybe a suggestion to make. Uh, I would recommend strongly looking at the ongoing programs we have today, and, and they're pretty well documented. I know for, certainly for QSTP and the institutes, we have a fairly clear roadmap of what we're trying to do. If given the projects we are on, that are underway, you can add a major momentum to it or imp have impact on it. We'd love to hear from you. If it's a brand new project, then there is a mechanism, either through QNRF or through the Arabic Expatriate Scientist Program. And, and, and I think there are different mechanisms in place. So I think the easiest one is to really carefully look at what projects are under, going on at the moment and tell us if you, what you can contribute to make an impact. Just very brief comments. So I will try to follow the suggestions there by Dr. Monsif. So my name again is Mustafa Abdelwahed. Uh, uh, so I will give a, a good uh, proof of concept of what I think about. Uh, I, I will give a, a story of a Chinese uh, scientist who was in California just doing biochemistry postdoc studies. He was following some of the research and development done at Harvard University by a professor Judah Falkman talking about the people who are familiar with anti angiogenic anti-cancer field. There is a drug discovered by Dr. Falkman uh, uh, called understatin. So the drug went to clinical phase one, two. They have some solubility problem with that drug. The Chinese scientist doing his postdoc in California was following all of that. The company taking care of that drug called Entremet didn't deal well. The, Ch the, the Chinese scientist went back to his country. He, he uh, explained to the government of China that he can solve the solubility of understatin by very, very simple technical biochemistry tools. For the people who are in biology here, he just added seven amino acid histidine tag to the protein, which is a recombinant protein, and the understatin changed the name to understar. He did clinical phase one, two, and three in three years. The understars were approved in China in 2005 and it's one of the most used drugs for, call it, for many types of cancers, and this is a huge impact. So that's a way of copying other scientists to do the same stories, to come up with the know-how technology. There are patented technologies that can be done. If the infrastructure is done, instead of talking about cancer treatment, it's a huge field. Why not to look for a niche? Why not to bring a know-how platform technology, as you suggested, that could be applied for different products and come up with a, 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 a formation of a pipeline of patents which could attract, going back to your attraction again. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take another question. There's one gentleman in, in the middle. Can we get a microphone down to, to the second row, please? My name is Mohammed Ibrahim Al Masri. I'm Egyptian living in Canada for the last 43 years. And my area of expertise is microchip design. And Egypt is on my mind since January 25th. Uh, I've been involved in many startups, uh, many of them very successful. The founders are multi billionaires, not me. And one of them is the one that invented the Blackberry which is a REM corporation in my hometown of Waterloo. Um, this is a general comment. Uh, I think uh, you articulated what it takes for success. Um, my experience, uh, uh, that there are five. The first one is need. The second one is vision to fill up that need. The third one is a champion. And the fourth one is a team. And the fifth one is money. So money actually comes the fifth not the first. 
And this is opposite to the popular uh, belief that money is very important in startup. It's not. It's actually the fifth one. Um, that's the general comment. The, the, the second one is that an invitation for Amran, because I'm chairing a conference in mid-January near Tahrir Square on American University in Cairo on a human development of Sinai, and I'm impressed of, of your achievement, and I would like to uh, invite you to give a talk on Green Gulf, uh, uh, and also how to expand it to Green Sinai uh, in solar energy, solar power, solar mapping, and also to invite Steve to the same conference to uh, tell us the story of how his organization is involved with the Egyptian scene, and uh, for both of them, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think um, we might as well stay longer and hopefully get more invitations. <laughs> <laughs> I think we are getting to a point where we might have to call it a day. It's been a wonderful uh, conference. Thank you, Labdalali, and your team for organizing it. And the panel, thank you very much for your time and effort and coming all this way. Thank you.